You're listening to the Born to Kick Ass podcast with Matt Tomassi and can be found at borntokickass.com slash episode 10. Welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast, where you're introduced to the most fascinating people on the planet. Learn the ingredients of greatness that you can apply to your life. And now your host, Matthew Tomassi. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audio book of your choice and a 30-day free trial by visiting borntokickass.com slash audible. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. To download your free audio book today, go to borntokickass.com slash audible. Again, that's borntokickass.com slash audible for your free audio book. George Bullard is a British endurance athlete, explorer and adventurer, and to date has completed over 2,000 miles on foot in the polar regions. In 2008, at the age of 19, George Bullard and Alex Hibbert completed the world's longest fully unsupported polar journey, making a 1,374-mile return crossing of the Greenland ice cap in 113 days. On their return journey, they managed to lose two of their food depots that had been stored in the ice for over 100 days. This left them to survive on two and a half flapjacks per day for the last 10 days. To date, George has completed 14 expeditions around the world and guided over 300 people. Some of these expeditions include a relay swim across the English Channel, the transatlantic yacht race, which is 2,796 nautical miles, and riding 2,300 miles from England to the Greek island of Zakynthos. Enjoy the interview. G'day, George. It's Matt here. Welcome to the Born to Kick Ass podcast. Hi, Matt. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for your time today. Um, I've been through your website, uh, georgebullard.co.uk, and I've noticed you've done quite a few expeditions, which uh, I'd love to dive into. But uh, before we get into that, can you maybe give us a background um, of yourself, where you grew up, where you're based now, and I guess how you got into, you know, this expedition lifestyle? Yeah, of course. So uh, I guess let me just let me start by saying it's uh, great to be on and thanks very much for taking your time to, I guess, kind of make this and produce this. And I guess thanks to your listeners for, for listening. Um, so I, uh, as you might be able to tell, I'm based in the UK. Uh, from my accent and uh, so I grew up in Norfolk which is about two hours northeast of London uh, basically in, in, in a green field which uh, I think for some people for, or for a, a, a very small population of people it's a privilege to, to grow up in a green field now when such a large population grew up in, in cities and things living in a green field is pretty lucky pretty fortunate and I, I then moved over to the, to the US where my dad worked over there in New York and uh, California. Uh, and then we moved back basically when I was three uh, and I've lived in the UK ever since. And uh, I guess, you know, now at the ripe old age of, uh, of 27, just, I uh, have been doing expeditions and challenging myself really uh, in many different ways for the last, I guess, uh, 10, 15 years. And uh, now uh, I... Have done just quit my job in uh, in finance, uh, which I can strongly recommend. Uh, <laughs> I did a fourteen and a half months behind a desk, but as you can imagine, I was slightly bouncing off the walls trying to get out and do the next trip. So um, um, yeah, that's and, and now I I'm running a small little company called iGo Adventures, uh, which is pretty cool. We've just come come back from Norway on our first trip, but uh, I think we'll come on to that later on. As to the second part of your question, uh, as to the sort of the, the why adventures, the why outdoors, and, and and what is it that I do? I think that's quite a long question, and I don't want to drone on for too long. But for me, 
as I said, growing up in a in the countryside um, has been uh, a huge honour and something that's really kind of ignited my um, my my thirst for adventure. So when I was growing up, I, I mean, I was making dens and climbing trees and swimming in rivers and catching fish and you know trying to live off the land as much as I could, uh, just because I enjoyed it, not because I was actively trying to become an explorer or an adventurer, just because that's what I love doing and uh, because I, I'm passionate about it. I, I like coming back with the dirt under my fingernails sort of thing. So I think from that, uh, and I guess from our atti- from, um, um, from my attitude towards life. I think whenever the opportunity arises to do adventures, um, I, I tend to sort of jump in with, with both feet, which uh, up to now has been a good thing. <laughs> I've noticed as well you've done quite a bit of swimming. Was that sort of your main um, sport growing up, mm. like throughout school? And... Um, s- sort of. Uh, yeah, so so going through going through school, I, I mean, I was I was uh, I, I was okay at sport. I could uh, kick a ball and and whatever else. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I was I was okay at as well was swimming. And then when I went to my senior school, uh, between the ages of sort of thirteen to eighteen, before going to university or college, um, there was a, a few of us who were very very keen swimmers and uh, we had an amazing coach a guy called Nick Adams who I basically kind of um, who I can uh, get you know hand all of my, all of this to because I mean he's the guy who's inspired a, a lot of people and a lot of young people to do some incredible things and I guess we were or well, the years that I were there were amongst his sort of first <clears throat> um, first team of, of swimmers who he inspired um he's i mean i don't know whether you've done much swimming yourself matt but he's an amazing guy because most swimming coaches that i've ever come across stand on the side of the pool and write up notes onto a board whereas nick was uh, in the pool swimming every yard with us um and you know it's, it's amazingly inspiring when someone does that and uh you know he got us involved in the channel in the swimming around new york around barbados um along lake zurich so it kind of meant that every year we basically had a goal, had something to train for, and uh, and we worked seriously hard at it, you know, in the pools before class in the morning and then in the evening again. And so I guess that taught us a, a really unique uh, mindset. Um, and, of course, not all those swims went to plan, and, and, and that gave us, again, a, a unique experience in that handling failure is something that most people can't, or some people don't really have the ability to, to do. Um, so you've mentioned, you just mentioned the English Channel, Um that's what sort of distance is that is it what did you depart from dover is it like dover to calais or is there a different um route that uh, a lot of english channel swimmers depart from 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 england no it's it's exactly that route um it's from uh, from uh, it's from shakespeare beach in dover to cap on uh, on the french French uh, coast, and it is literally the, the shortest way. Really, I mean, it's twenty two point uh, one miles. I think maybe twenty two point six miles. Um, so it's a, it's a fair old distance. But I mean, there's a very interesting story about that uh, <laughs> that whole whole palaver. In that, I guess it helps to illustrate my own personality a little bit. So this this channel swim was um, was a team event. Obviously, we were thirty, we were fourteen and fifteen at the time. And uh, <laughs> Nick Adams was, as I said, our coach, and he basically wanted to make it into a TV series, and made it onto a TV series, and the whole selection process, and whittling the whittling us down to a team of six guys, six young teenagers. And uh, I was very good in the in the pool at swimming, but not so good at handling cold water. I'm quite long and thin. Anyway, so it turns out that I, at the last minute, didn't make the team. Um, then obviously I was devastated because I put in a lot of effort, and a lot of time, a lot of training. Um, so I guess on the face value I'd failed. But um, I knew that the, one morning in the middle of our exam, our school exams, um, they were leaving because the weather window had kind of arrived and they had permission to go. So they were off at two in the morning. And uh, I broke out of my house um, <laughs> to, go, to go and wait them off. You know, they're my best mates. I've known them for a very long time and been through a lot with them. So I was like, you know, I want to go and wave them off and pat them on the back and say, you know, Shame not to come with you guys, but um, you know, I'll be there in spirit, sort of thing. Anyway, Nick turned around to me and said, "One of the one of the other team have got um, went out last night, and uh, after at the end of his exams because he was a senior boy, and uh, and, and got drunk and stuff." 
<laughs> he then said, do you want to come? So I, uh, I said, yes. And I, he said, if you can get the permission of your housemaster, you can come with us. And so I knocked on my housemaster and woke him up at two in the morning <laughs> and went along with the team. So, uh, yeah, that's the story about the channel swim. <laughs> um, with, like, uh, you've done the English Channel, I believe you, was it uh, uh, Manhattan in New York? You tried to, uh, another relay, was it like a, another team, um, a, a group of you guys trying to swim around Manhattan, was that right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So Manhattan, uh, around the island of Manhattan is about um, 45 kilometres. And uh, we did it as a team of four, I think, that time. Um, you know, again, we were, we were teenagers, and so it's, so I think backing ourselves, or, or and we and we had lots of other, other other commitments outside of just swimming. So we weren't, you know, highly highly trained swimmers in the outdoors and stuff. So doing it as a team was probably our best way of completing it. Um, but again, uh, well, not again, but that trip wasn't a success because of uh, the mother nature. There was a big storm that came through as we were heading down the Hudson River. I was just swimming past the uh, the major sewage works in Manhattan. So. I guess it was actually a bit of a treat to be pulled out of the water, sort of wrestling my way through um, through the sewage of New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, with these particular um, uh, adventures, in between them, were you regularly swimming to keep up your your base, your swimming base, and your endurance base? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess uh, I'm very lucky, and I probably it's quite similar to some of the other guys who you have on your podcast. Uh, I'm very lucky enough to sort of maintain a base level of fitness, which is uh, obviously not adequate to do these things necessarily, but <clears throat> it's um, it's a good base to start from. I don't I don't sort of stop stop anything. I'm constantly sort of doing stuff and cycling around London, and you know whatever I'm doing, it's sort of vaguely activi- activity based. Um, <laughs> so I, as I said, I maintain a, a base level of fitness, which tends to help me uh, when it comes to training for the next trip. Um, so yeah, that works well. I've I've noticed on your Facebook page, um, you kayak up and down the Thames. Is that how you get to work? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, you know, between Facebook and Instagram and whatever other sort of social media um, uh, methods we have, I um, I I've been kayaking to work on a blow up kayak called Kevin and. Uh, <laughs> You know, I just again, it's a sort of unique thing that I sort of looked at the looked at the Thames. I'm lucky enough to live on the Thames, so uh, and I work quite close to the Thames. So I thought, why not? Just when the tides are right, when the currents are right, let's jump in and see if I um, see if I can do it. And it's what it's sort of five and a half, six miles in the mornings and after work. So it's uh, it's good fun. So uh, the actual time on the Thames, how long does that take? Uh, I have to. I used to work for a bank, so I had to be in quite early in the morning. So I used to be on the water by about 5.30 in the morning. Um, yeah. But it'd take about an hour. Uh, but then by the time I've sort of taken a whole load of pictures and <laughs> funny pictures of me walking through the city of London with the kayak on my head, it sort of normally takes about an hour and a half to get to work. <laughs> and h- how's that in, uh, in winter? Do you do that yeah, in winter at all? I, just, or I mean, I started cold? doing it back in November. Um, and it was just kind of dark really and a bit cold but you know again I guess men- mentally you get cold feet and cold hands but I, I know that in about enough, two hours time when um, when I get to when I get to the office there'll be a you know, warm shower and an air conditioning and a, and a hot cup of tea you know so actually and, and a comfy seat so it's a you know it's a, I don't have any need to sort of dress up in all the thermals and things and, uh, yeah just sort of, and how do you actually get the kayak when you get to um, the other side? Yeah. What do you do with the kayak? Do you is it like actually inf- inflatable? Do you just deflate it and then wrap it up and then take it to yeah. work, or do you sort of park it? No, somewhere? no, no. It's, 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 it's as I said, inflatable. So uh, so Kevin gets deflated down to his minimum. And I sort of tuck him under my arm and walk up to the office, um, <laughs> which is um, which is. I mean, everyone found me fairly extraordinary when I was working in finance when the. Their lives are fairly rudimentary, fairly sort of um, straightforward. <laughs> based on- yeah, yeah. Now that would have uh, raised a few eyebrows. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, here, here he comes. Here comes yeah. George with the uh, the. Yeah, they all thought I was extraordinary, but they probably still do. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, you've done some uh, pretty, pretty incredible expeditions, which we can get into. Um, so yeah, I go adventures. Let's talk about that. Um, you've recently just come back from Norway. Was yeah, t- tell us about that. 
So basically, I, I, as I said, I've uh, I quit my job in uh, working in the city for uh, in finance, um, having done as I said four and a half months there, which I was delighted about. Um, and I was sort of looking to. I, I, I felt bad that I've slightly turned my back on what made me unique on this planet, um, which I guess is adventure and expeditions and the outdoors. And so I, uh, I kind of turned back towards it and started speaking again. And a company called Igo Adventures got in touch and said that they're they're launching their new expedition, their first expedition, and uh, they they wanted me to come and speak. And so I I went along and met the guys and and spoke to the team and and they and they kind of enjoyed what I, what I said and said basically they invited me to come on board. Um, and it kind of fitted, and it fits well, and it's great fun. And there's, a, I mean, it's a small team at the moment, but it's um, it's great and it holds a lot of potential. So, I Go Adventures itself is about um, basically uh, bottling up that unique life experience into a one week um, into a one week uh, adventure. And it, it basically all came from a guy called Bobby Melville who car- who rode across the Atlantic as part of the Talisker Whiskey Challenge from the Cape Verde Islands to Antigua or Barbados, I think. Um, and on that, ex- on, that, on that expedition, he realized the power of, of adventure and expeditions in terms of creating life-changing experiences and wanted to bottle that up and basically provide it to, to anyone who wants it. And, uh, you know, guys who quite often people at the moment are, are very time poor, but, um, but still want those life-changing experiences. So the whole basis of IGO is, is, to, is to create those... Um, those uh, life-changing experiences, I guess, but in a week time frame, and uh, I guess yeah. they combine five different aspects of wilderness um, uh, and diversity, um, camaraderie, philanthropy. Um, yeah. so, so all those sort of things combined together basically helps to make a combination of uh, of experiences over over a week long a week long expedition. Uh, and we just come yeah. out from Norway, where we did um, where we did a quadrathlon style uh, adventure. Uh, over four okay. different disciplines over four days, so it was kind of cool. We saw yeah. the Northern Lights and you know dog sledding and what was that like? What's the uh, pretty special one? Yeah. I can um, there's, there's an awesome picture of uh, of our camp. Um, so we, we don't we don't, we go from camp from A to B over the course of four days. So it's very much, very much feels like an expedition as well. We aren't based at point A and go out and back to point A every night. You're very much travelling. So um, you know, we saw the Northern Lights, and it was it was extremely special. I can send you the picture if you like. I've seen it on your your Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're amazing things, and uh, I guess you guys down in uh, down in Australia don't often see them. So <laughs> yeah, um, uh, there's an equivalent. I think it's called the Aurora um, Australis. The Aurora Borealis. Yeah, the Borealis is uh, up north, but. Um, yeah, I haven't actually seen them myself uh, in real life, but um, yeah, I reckon it'd be um, quite quite. Do they come uh, as far south as Australia? Um, in the, I believe in the outback, there's that they, they term it the Aurora Australis. Um, I, I don't know the the you know the the f- how the lights are formed, but um, I think it is a, it is the similar sort of phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, but but they must. Do they come as far north as Australia? Uh, as far south as Australia. Well, the the the, uh, the borealis come from the north, and the australis come from from the south, so they come north. Do you know what I mean? Like towards the middle of the globe. Do you know what I mean? I think yeah. Well, in certain parts of Australia, you can see it. it ah, awesome. Yeah, but I haven't seen it myself yet. But uh, I reckon it would be uh, quite extraordinary. Yeah, they're pretty special. Now. Do you have a particular expedition like you've the list going through your website is as long as my arm um every year you you do a major um expedition um is there a particular one that you're most proud of yeah i guess um uh i guess there is actually so my, my title title expedition today's um is is the longest fully unsupported polar journey so I guess that's that basically says that, uh, that there's no one else on the planet who's walked as far in a polar region without support, um, without resupply. Yeah, let's do a bit of a deep dive into that. That was in uh, Greenland? Yeah, it was in Greenland in 2008. And I guess I, I, this kind of opens up a whole, a whole other interesting area of polar exploration and what, what, what it's... Um, what it entails and of course it was uh i did it with a guy called alex hibbert who's a he's a great man and 
we decided not to go anywhere near the North Pole. We decided not to do it purposefully on uh, on Antarctica or on the Arctic itself um, because we feel and we believe a bit like the summit of Everest and, uh, and, and in fact the South Pole and the North Pole really. They're becoming like a tourist destination uh, and in order to do a polar journey or in order to be sort of um, recognised around a pub table as being an explorer or as being a, a hero, or to having or, or to have done an expedition up in the poles um, or up in the Arctic, you need to have gone to the North Pole. And of course, this is not true, and um, at all. In fact, there are many, many, many other places where you can get just as to, uh, exactly the same experience, and in many ways harder, um, the, but, but without spending the money. Um, you know, the the, the uh, having the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and all that sort of stuff that, that requires you to get to the North Pole. And there are a lot of people now who are walking the last degree, which is, I mean, a great challenge and a great thing to do. But of course, it means them flying across the entire of the, Atl- the entirety of the uh, Arctic Ocean or the Arctic Ice Cap in order to, or Arctic, yeah, Arctic Ocean, in order to reach the last degree, so they can walk 120 nautical miles into the uh, into the finish line um, and, and, and then they can come home and sit, and sit around a table and say they've been to the North Pole and for guys like what I do and for kind of I guess proper explorers uh, who kind of dedicate a lifetime to doing extraordinary expeditions that, that connect the north coast of Canada to the north coast of Russia and go via the North Pole and they spend a hundred and hundred whatever days on the ice and um, uh, and don't have a resupply and they, they're completely kind of self-supported and stuff. I think it really takes away from what from what they do. So, long story short, Alex and I decided to do this the longest fully unsupported polar journey over the Greenland ice cap, which is um, you know which presented its own issues. Um, uh, it has some seriously strong winds, uh, which the Arctic Ocean doesn't get. It has something called catabatic winds, which are winds driven by gravity, and of course they can be they can be very 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 strong, and in fact often deadly. If, if you're caught unaware in them and uh, it was only last year or maybe the year before when um, an expedition got caught in caught in a catabatic wind and, and um, all of them died apart from two um, so this place is actually you know just as dangerous just as cold just as inhospitable just as remote and isolated uh, as anywhere else and so that's why we decided to go there <laughs> and how did the how did this come about um, who was your mate Alex, yeah, a guy called Alex. So, I mean, yeah, if you could maybe just uh, tell us how this, how you guys came up with the idea of wanting to attempt this. How did that come about? So, I guess this this time I was exceptionally lucky in, in that um, I just come back from an expedition in Antarctica with um with a charity called British Exploring, who basically take young people abroad, uh, young people away on expeditions, and do sort of um, leadership development and. Um, and those sorts of skills. Uh, and I come back from Antarctica and I was speaking in the Royal Geographical Society in London. And I met this guy called Alex, Alex Hibbert, who, um, who had this, this idea. It was very much his, his baby. And he was looking for a teammate to come with him. <laughs> He'd seen my, uh, my, I guess at that stage, my CV of adventures so far. There were a few swims and, you know, and uh, expedition in Antarctica and said, this guy, this guy might be able to do it with me. I mean, not many people are silly and are stupid enough to uh, to to accept this these sorts of challenges, which involve you, you know, going away for a, you know, what was to be over a hundred hundred and ten days, and uh, not see another human being, and you know, go from A to B and back to A again. So that presents mental challenges when you're on the outbound journey. Uh, and he said, "Do you want to come and with me?" And so, obviously, within five seconds, I turned around and said, "Yes." And that was the first time that I met Alex. The second time I met Alex was down at his house in Portsmouth, and we were packing our sledges with uh, 110 days worth of food. And the third time I met Alex was when we were leaving from Stansted Airport. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's <pretty> crazy. <clears throat> so the moment when the moment he um, threw this the gauntlet down and invited you onto this. Um, this adventure from your mm-hmm. perspective there was no hesitation you were just yep i'm in yeah i mean i guess i guess there was i mean uh, there was a very limited hesitation i thought this was a most incredible opportunity that actually very few humans on this planet will ever get and if i um, you know if i can have a quick look at what what he's got planned and you know the the, the route and just 
make myself comfortable that what he's got planned is going to be feasible <clears throat> and it's possible, then it's a goer. And uh, as I said, I, I, I'm such, such a believer in the fact that so few humans get given these opportunities uh, that actually when they come around, it's important to grab them with both hands. And I think it takes quite a unique person. I, I, I wouldn't have thought that every single person would, would do that. Um, but I think that's probably what makes me a little different to, to some people. <laughs> Can we uh, maybe touch on the, the planning side of this um, adventure and also the training? How long did it take you to you know, to plan all the logistics and – fine tune everything you know from your nutrition to um you know the approach and you know how many kilometers per day you 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 were aiming to cover as well as the training aspect yeah i mean i guess i could this is the basis of a you know an hour long lecture really yeah. and it's uh it's as fast there's so many different facets to this to this question i guess we'll just sort of delve into it gently let's start with the food the <clears throat> food side of things so as I said, we were fully unsupported. So that means there are no resupplies. There are no uh, there are no external aids, or we weren't being helped in any way. So what we left with, what we departed uh, civilization with on day one or day zero, <clears throat> was what we were going to have for the rest of the expedition, um, for the rest of time. We what, that was the food we needed to cover one thousand four hundred miles, fully unsupported up in the Arctic. So. The the problem that this presented was that at that time, in fact, quite often now still, uh, there aren't many people who've been over 100 days on an expedition uh, living off that food. And so we weren't sure what would happen to our bodies as the expedition developed and, you know, and, uh, and as we kind of deteriorated <clears throat> throughout over that time. Because obviously, you know, what we have in those bags needs to sustain life. So you need all the vitamins, all the all the proteins and all every, everything you need is in that bag, which is quite a quite a weird thing to think about you know we weren't getting anything from anywhere else it was what was in that bag was needed needed to needed to sustain life <clears throat> so that was quite an interesting thing i guess kind of a bit of a quite a scary angle to the trip that no one really knew about um when it comes to the training i guess uh, i said i said before we left actually to a to the radio station back here in the uk that the physical side of things is 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 going to be a tough one but uh, the mental side of things is uh, is the one that's going to get you first. I think I feel obviously this is before I left, so I wasn't sure. But boy, when I got there, the mental side of things and the, the top two inches of any human being is uh, is infinitely more powerful than than the rest of it. Um, and I guess that's something that this expedition certainly taught me to control and taught me to manage was my brain and where I was thinking and how how it kind of you know, spun off on all these different angles and made me believe that, you know, I was on this expedition with a whole team of people and it wasn't just Alex and myself on the ice cap and how I, it's, 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 it's an incredible thing that I, I had no idea as to how powerful my head was. Yeah. And some days it meant I woke up thinking I can't do this. I need to get home. I've got to get home right now. And then within the next 10 seconds after thinking that thought, I, I realized that, um, this is a unique, this is an incredible opportunity. And as soon as you get home, you'll arrive home and you'll sit on that sofa and collapse into the, into the, into the, into the chair and turn on the television and just think, what have I missed out on? What have I just kind of sacrificed when I, when I hung up my boots? Cause I was, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable and a bit miserable. Um, it's such a, it was, I guess on the, on the long term, a relatively short term um, problem. The fact that I hadn't seen a human for, 113 days was relatively short term on the grand scheme of things so i guess and, and and doing the same thing day in day out for 11 hours and 40 minutes each day and living with the same person and sleeping within seven inches of him on a on a, on a therm rest on the ice it's cold it's miserable it's uncomfortable it's you haven't washed you haven't changed your underwear you haven't you know you haven't seen your girlfriend or whatever <clears throat> so it's um it's weird it's a it's a very hard thing to describe and to uh, to try and bottle it up into a an hour long yeah, interview. Yeah, yeah, it's extremely hard to uh, to summarise, you know, over 110 days into um, you know a 20 minute um, conversation. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But um, what what is what's Greenland like? Is it literally? Is it just covered in ice? Like, you know, the particular part yeah. that you went to. Yeah, absolutely. So Greenland is the uh, 
is the second largest island in the world. Uh, it's the second largest ice cap in the world after Antarctica. And um, around the outside is is uh, is where all the people, everyone lives. Um, there are a few, I guess, as you go further north around the island, there are fewer and fewer inhabitants. Obviously, <clears throat> you get 24 hours darkness, 24 hours sunlight. You get obviously colder winters. It's more, it's much more harsh conditions. So Greenland itself is basically a huge dome of an ice cap in the middle, uh, which starts down at sea level, and there's sort of mountains that poke out the top of the of the ice, and then the ice just grows up into the middle of the ice cap, uh, up to about ten thousand feet. Um, so it's it's pretty high, and uh, and and as a result of this huge dome, you can imagine this just it's there, there's not there's sort of there are very few different undulations. It's just a massive dome. <clears throat> and uh, that's as a result, these catabatic winds are generated from from that from that sort of gravitational drive from the top all the way down to the coast. Um, so that's really what Greenland. I mean, it's hard. There's not much else. I mean, although it's called Greenland, it's very much sort of white land. Yeah. And there's not much not much there to be honest. On top of, in fact, the, the locals believe that the ice cap itself is haunted, so they don't go there, and they think that we're all crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the time of year that you went was it? Uh, like I know that the further north you get, you know, like in summer, the daylight hours are longer and reverse yeah. for, for winter. What, what sort of time of year were you there? So we, we actually kind of spanned quite a, a three uh, sort of um, seasons. So we left in uh, in uh, March time, um, beginning of March, and we arrived back in the UK at the end of July. Yep. So basically what that meant was <clears throat> that we we not only saw the sun rise for the last time and then it's then it circled us into 24 hour sunlight but after 3 months we also saw it set for the first time. Okay. So uh, it kind of meant that we were there for uh, for the whole for the entire of summer but also for the um sort of the beginning of spring or the end of spring and the beginning of autumn um really for those guys. So it was a really interesting interesting place to be yeah. I mean, although it was Quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been quite fascinating seeing, um, you know, the span of an entire season. You know, mm, like seeing absolutely. like every day and, and night, uh, seeing the position of the sun over that full um, time span. It would have been quite um, quite uh, incredible to, um, to have experienced. Yeah, and it's very disorientating and, and – uh... Your, your your body clock kind of gets when you when you first get there anyway your body clock gets a bit confused and you're you're sort of up talking at one o'clock in the morning and suddenly suddenly realise that it's it's that time and think geez I've got to get to bed I've got to be up in you know four hours time or whatever <laughs> so um, so with this particular expedition was it like a point to point or was it like an out and back yeah so I, I mentioned this earlier on that we went um, we went out and back. And this, we did this for two reasons. I mean, one really was to get the distance. So we were aiming to break the world record for, for the longest in terms of distance uh, under supported polar journey. And uh, so uh, we, we had to kind of, as I say, get that distance. So we went from a, point A to point B and back to point A again, uh, across uh, over the in, sort of from the south, uh, east of Greenland, really to the north, northwest and back again. Um, and of course, this then presented it even mentally even harder a sort of um, thing to handle because obviously for the first 70 days you were walking away from home you were you were getting further and further and further away from your end point so i guess that was another mental thing which was seriously seriously hard to handle and uh, kind of it was a very strange feeling after 71 days of walking away from home not seeing another human being seeing nothing on the horizon just white and talking to one person, never seeing the colour green, not eating up a plate, and you know, never, never going to the loo on a proper loo, you yeah. know, and having always having to rush your rush your paperwork and things. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a very strange feeling, kind of getting to her halfway mark, getting to point B, and then turning around and taking the first step towards home. It almost felt like we'd sort of made it when we even only got halfway, because you know, it was uh, just that was the way it felt. Um, but that also allowed us to to lay food depots on the outbound journey, which we then fed off on the way home. And it basically meant that our sledges could get lighter and lighter yeah. before we then sh- kind of um, hopped between depots, if you like, in order to get home. But this obviously presented lots of problems and lots of issues. Um, I guess the, the, the best news was that we could travel faster. So yeah. at the beginning of the expedition, we were carrying 
I guess, the equivalent to the heaviest Aussie rules player ever um, in, our sled- in our sledges. Um, we had 200 kilograms in the back. And so it basically meant that we were moving at less than five miles in a day often. Is this 200 total or is this 200 each? 200 kilos each. Each, okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we had 110 days worth of food, which is only about, that's about 150, 120 kilos. And that's before we put in uh, all our safety gear, our sledges, our, our, um, our uh, camping equipment and all that sort of basic stuff and protection and first aid and stuff. So yeah. by the time we put all that in there, um, it, it had got up to about 190 kilos, 200 kilos. So it was a bit of a beast. Uh, and of course, it meant that early on we weren't traveling very fast. So did you have a uh, tent each or was it just a shared tent? Yeah, we had a three-man shared tent. Yeah. But of course... This this place you're living in, so it's not minimal. It's it was certainly fairly fairly comfortable. We had a nice long porch, um, which we could um, you know dig a hole in and sit inside and and uh, and make water. We had plenty of room for all of our kit and things to get out, out of the out of the weather. I mean, our sledges obviously lived outside. Yeah, but um, you know, uh, we were talking about the A to B, weren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, we we lost some food. <laughs> that was one of the issues. Um, so we had 110 days of the food in our sledges. And uh, we lost uh, uh, nine days worth of food. Um, well, we had 110 days worth of food in our sledges. The expedition was 113 days and we lost six days. So we had a nine-day deficit where we basically lived off two and a half flapjacks a day uh, in order to make it into our last... Um, our last, <laughs> our last uh, that would have been tough. It was a bit miserable, but I guess worse things happen at sea apparently. <laughs> so did you, with those um, flapjacks, did you eat the, did you have a, a particular approach when it came to having them? Did you have them in the morning, you know, before you started off or you just had bits bits of it during the day or, or all of it in one go? How did you? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very important on these trips that they're not only are they sustainable in terms of your physical output, but your, but your, your sort of input, the calories you're putting in, are also fairly constant and you're constantly sort of keeping yourself energized and you're not going through dip peaks and troughs. <clears throat> so it basically meant that we had quite a strict routine with ourselves when it came to eating uh, and, and when we ate and how much we ate. Uh, and it basically involved having one snack after every single break or, or having something to eat and something to drink every time we stopped sledging, we stopped hauling our sledges. Uh, <clears throat> and so, it, you know, uh, Again, it's another large topic, but some people, some people on expeditions like to say, today I'm going to run 100 miles. Um, or, or, uh, but personally, I kind of, unless you're in a, in a, in a race, um, in a race situation, like an ultra marathon, obviously that approach won't work so well on an, on an expedition like this Greenland one, um, because obviously our sledges were so heavy and there was no chance we were going to walk 100 miles or walk 25 miles in a day. So what we said was, instead, we're going to go by time. And we said that weather permitting, we were going to walk for 10 hours or 11 hours and 40 minutes each day or be out on the ice for 11 hours and 40 minutes a day. I think that that, that surmounted to 10 hours, 40 minutes walking each day. Um, so we basically put the time in. Uh, and then if we hadn't gone very far in that time, well, that's that's as much as we could do. We needed to get rest and we need to eat, you know, and uh, uh, before we go at it again the next day. And I guess doing that day in day out means you can cover lots of miles yeah now with the fluid intake um how do you how do you drink um and also do you sort of prep up um or defrost water or melt water um prior to starting off or do you how do you manage your uh, your fluid intake yeah, it's a good question. So I guess at the beginning of the expedition, both Alex, I mean, I was 19, Alex was 20, 22, yeah, I think, 23, essentially. Both, um, I guess, learn, not quite learning, but both sort of working out what the best way or the best thing was and what we needed very early on in the expedition. We were both working that out. And so I remember at lunch, we, I think, two days in a row, at the, one of the, in the, almost the first week, we got our stove out. Uh, at lunch to basically melt water and have a sit down lunch and you know not sit down lunch but have a sort of a slightly longer lunch because we felt that was important for our, our recuperation that day and then we realized that actually there's just there's just zero point in doing that it took time it, it took an effort it, it was complicated it was involved getting our hands out it involved getting cold fingertips because you're trying to you know use 
a, you know, it's on a lighter stove and it was just all complicated. And the, and the, and the rate that the heat gets taken away from your hands when you're handling metal is, is, is incredible. So in the end, we scrapped it and we then made our water the night before and, and then kind of slept with it. You know, we made three liters of water each, each day per person. And then we had a liter flask as well, um, which we could then, uh, you know, use however we liked. And in fact, we used that, we then actually used that for lunch. Uh, but also it always changed you know for, for a week we suddenly had a good idea we're like oh you know what? i'm gonna have a bit of breakfast or a bit of my porridge for lunch because i'm feeling a bit hungry then and not really hungry at breakfast so it changed but that's really how we managed our water we did it all the night before slept with it and then uh and then obviously it froze a bit throughout the day but uh i guess that was our best best way to handle it <laughs> okay and I've seen this, um, you know, in heaps of photos, but I've never had the opportunity to ask someone about it. But the tape on the nose. Oh, yeah. Can you explain Yeah, that? of course. So uh, so your your nose and your sort of cheekbones are really sort of quite exposed um, beneath your goggles. And they sort of poke out a bit. And um, it's basically just plain zinc oxide tape that you'll use to strap up your feet when you're running or doing doing any other, maybe any sort of long distance exercise zinc oxide tape that we then just cover our noses and, and cheeks with a little bit just it helps with the wind burn um and helps with it just to, just to protect them a little bit against the frost and the cold and the sun and all that sort of stuff and uh, you know our faces end up swelling quite a lot for, for because of exactly that reason even though we put on sun cream every morning and uh, stuff so that's all the zinc oxide tape is there to do just to protect your nose a little bit from the bite of the wind did you get sunburn at all or did you have to was there a possibility of getting sunburn or actually snowburn? Yeah, absolutely. Snow blindness and all that oh, sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a huge possibility. Um, obviously, you're outside all day, but for the most part, you're quite well covered up. But it is your sort of lips and, and, uh, your, and your nose and things that really do, are, are still remain a little bit exposed. And your tongue, weirdly. <laughs> um, it's obviously hard to put something on your tongue, but sort of the end of it sometimes gets sunburned. It got, mine got sunburned in Norway a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, on Greenland, it was, we were very disciplined with that because obviously, you know, guys like Rand Fiennes, they, they often sort of forget to do that and they come back with these huge swollen lips on, and stuff. And it's actually totally avoidable. I mean, Alex and I came back looking, I guess, slightly emaciated, but in terms of our, our hygiene, in terms of our sort of brushing our teeth and making sure we didn't get sunburned and making sure we were kind of vaguely healthy, we were, we were quite good at, um, but it meant that we kind of, as I said, put something on it every morning and made sure we were protected from it if it was if the sun was shining, obviously. Yeah. And were there any crevasses at all? Yeah. So at the coastline. So when we when we when we started and when we got to the other other end, there were some some fairly large crevasses and things that that um, that, that got in the way, of course, um, sort of man guzzlers. And in fact, I might I might do a little. When is this going live? And I can do it. I can do a little post if you like with one of the biggest ones we came across, or I came across last year in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this will probably go live in um, probably three weeks or so. Great. Okay, and I do a little post then. You can about one of the largest crevasses we came across. It was fairly. It could swallow a few, a few, um, few tra- lorry trains. What are those road trains? A few yep, road yep. trains. Jeez. <laughs> So it's not like in the movies where, you know, you're walking along and the, the snow just falls away underneath your feet or do you actually see the crevasse? I guess it just, it just varies at, at what stage, at what time this, this uh, what time of year it is, how much snowfall there's been. But obviously there are some crevasses which, are, which are, they have something called snow bridges or just like filled with snow so you walk over them and don't notice them. Yep. Other crevasses might be completely open, for example, on a dry glacier where there's no snow on it. Uh, you can see them all. Um, but it, it just varies, really. It depends on the weather. Yep. Now, was there a particular point on this expedition that you were that you remember when you were at the, your lowest point mentally, and what did you do to sort of overcome that uh, low point? <laughs> there was actually I remember it very well um, because Alex and I were were very much on the point of uh, I guess not quite giving up, but very much on the on the edge of hypoglycemia um so basically we hadn't it was when we ran out of food we were very close to the end and we were i guess still still trying to make miles trying to get to the end trying to beat the kind of break the record and stuff and we ran out of food we lost our food depots um for one reason or another we couldn't find them but that's kind of another another story uh but as i said we were then on 
dangerously low rations. Having been eating nearly 6,000 calories a day, we were then eating, I mean, almost 1,000 calories a day on this sort of ghee, ghee, butter, sort of butter and flapjack mixture. Um, and uh, I remember it so well because it basically the, the surface and the weather had a lot of influence on your mental state and how how optimistic or not optimistic but how positive and how uh, how how good your morale was and it just started to snow really really heavily uh, over the space of about two days and the temperature got a little, a little warmer and when I say a little warmer I mean it got to sort of minus fifteen as opposed to as opposed to what it was throughout the whole trip it was about minus thirty and um minus twenty five minus thirty and what it meant that was at, at minus fifteen your clothes started to get a little damp uh, the snow melted on you, you got damp, you got wet, you then used more energy trying to keep yourself warm um, we were using more energy because it was snowing and it made up dragging our sledges uh, made 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 a lot of friction on our sledges, so it was heavy, it was tiring. We were knackered. Um, we were basically at breaking point almost uh, in terms of our physical ability. And uh, I just remember it so well that Alex and I were there kind of one evening and uh, we were kind of hands in head, absolutely knackered, 10 hours and 14 minutes on the ice. And we were spent. And, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, there's only two of us there. There was no one. We, we didn't meet anyone in the evenings to try and to, to who was there kind of making us hot food. It was just us. And you know the if we didn't get the didn't get the stove going or if we made a mistake in our in our sort of in our days state we would have uh, we would have not been here today and we were just so close to the edge of uh, hypoglycemia and, and not being able to function properly and I guess it was just Alex and I sitting there and we we made one phone call to uh, to to someone outside and you know back in the UK. And it basically kind of told us and reassured us that everything outside was was still normal, and uh, you know, life outside was still going on. Bear in mind, this was probably day day one hundred and five, day one hundred and six, day one hundred and seven. You know, we'd done a long time on the ice, and we were kind of just dangerously close. And it was just sort of. Then the next morning, we woke up, and uh, there had been a big, big, big uh, frost overnight. It got a lot colder, and it basically meant that this all this snow which had landed then became seriously hard and uh, I guess that that phone call I guess must have been a, a I don't know some good omen because obviously that temperature difference meant that we were then instead of sinking into the snow we were or the ice we were then back on top of it and we were then I guess making good miles and I think four days later we um we fell across the finish line <laughs> um so those were really tough days I remember it very well and what did you? What, what were your emotions when you saw the end point? You know, after 113 days of um, trudging through, you know, one of the most full-on places on earth. What, what were you going through when you uh, could see the end point? Very good question, Matt. It's actually a weird set of emotions. I mean, obviously, we were delighted to be at the end and to have achieved what we set out to achieve. So. We were mate. We were, I mean, unbelievable. But it's a, but it's a very strange sort of juxtaposition, because as I said, you're 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 delighted you've made it. But on the other hand, I felt weirdly vulnerable. So I this this expedition had become a way of life for me, and for both of us, it had to become a way of life. We had to treat it as a we were there to live and not to visit because we were there for so long, and mentally, that's how you need to handle it. And of course, as I said, it becomes a way of life, and I was suddenly quite concerned about what awaited me on on the other side you know life on the ice cap was so simple was so beautiful was so basic yet we had everything we needed um we had the you know warmth shelter and uh food and water and it kind of brought home to me that that's that's really all you need to for, for life on this planet and all the, all the stuff that goes around the outside is largely unnecessary and i guess uh, kind of arriving at the end made me quite a little bit concerned and anxious as to what lay outside. I mean, we were we were reassured that what that the outside world was still there only by planes flying over the top of the ice cap. Uh, that was our only way of sort of saying life outside of this our tiny little world, our sort of seven meter square tent was still going on. Um, so it was a strange place to be, but. Uh, but uh, as I said, our finish line was was a weird place. Um, yeah. We just sat, dug a hole, and made some water. <laughs> Celebrate. Uh, 
I noticed on um, a couple of photos um, on Facebook, in, on the inside of your tent, were you writing a, like a diary or a timeline or like a journal on the inside of your tent, your tent roof or your tent seal? I spotted, yes. So we did exactly that. Um, we, we did exactly that. We made a timeline. Yeah. And basically got a black marker and drew from the from the from one side of the tent all the way across the ceiling and down to the other side. As a sort of a bit of a um often a morale booster, but occasionally kind of made you quite depressed when you looked at how much further the almost obviously it wasn't really to scale, but we then had a rough a visual as to what we'd achieved and how much further we had to go and uh I mean, although it was important that we didn't see the journey as a mentally we didn't see it as a 1,400 mile journey and uh, we saw it as a day-to-day thing um, and we look forward to our food breaks and stuff uh, and that's really all we look forward to but this journey at this kind of time this timeline just helped us to visualize it a little bit and we we'd mark the weather we marked our feelings we marked you know where we left our depots we named our depots points in the UK which we which we kind of which made us feel or remind us of home and um so, for example, I live in Norfolk, and one of our depots on our on the tent ceiling was called Norfolk, and it just made me remember, remind me of home. And it then gave us something else to think about, and something else to look for. And you know, our conversation was like, "Oh, I'm looking." Instead of looking, saying, "I look forward to the next depot," it was like, "Oh, I look forward to getting home and seeing, our picking up our next depot." Sort of thing. So it's just a mental game. And what did you learn about yourself on this this particular expedition, um, or I, any of the expeditions that you go on? What did I learn? About? Yeah, that's a, another great question. So I guess bit of I guess mental fortitude and when it comes to doing something like this in such a harsh environment that actually your your physical your discipline and your your mental and physical discipline has got to be so strong and uh, or just so not strong necessarily but just solid and uh, but I, I guess it made me also feel very human very humble and very sort of you know I, I'm so lucky to have done what I've done and lucky to have seen what I've seen um, and I think it's given me a unique perspective on life on planet Earth, really, <laughs> you know, that it can be so basic, yet so full of happiness and stuff. So I learned a lot, really, um, yeah, on that trip. And it's hard to even bottle that up into an hour conversation, really, again. Yep, yep. Um, um, yeah, so you've done quite a few expeditions to, um, you know, the Arctic. You've been to Antarctica, um, Arctic Svalbard. Yep. What is it about the the polar regions that um, draws you keeps drawing you back? What do you love about it? I guess they're the inhospitability, as in they're just so hostile and so uh, and so remote. Um, and I, I think all the other places that I do enjoy the sea is the ocean. And in fact, we've got a big trip coming up in the ocean, which is which is very exciting this summer. Um, and I think uh, I think so few people get to experience. That these places relatively um and it makes you feel very small and very insignificant and uh and very um very human and very fallible very uh i'm looking for fallible is that is that a word I'm, i feel very uh um susceptible and very vulnerable in these places and uh, i think it just uh yeah i think you, just, you feel like part of nature and there's there's uh you're not like living in a big city where you've quite clearly made a huge impact on the on on the area just by living in in and around you know in London eight million other people <laughs> um, who are all sort of doing their bit. But I, th- I, I just think it helps. I just think they're beautiful and um, they're totally unique. Not many people see them, and I kind of want to use these places to inspire other people to 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 get out and just do stuff do stuff with their life and drop the television remote and put down the Game Boy and, and get outside. You haven't got to go for, you haven't got to go to Antarctica, you haven't got to go to Greenland or the the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean to find remoteness. But I'm just encouraging people just to get outside and, and do something. Um get on a bicycle for example. Yep. Super simple. Yep. Super easy. But it can be done by anyone. Now you mentioned you've got something coming up in June. Yeah. What, what is that? So um the background to this kayak to work scheme and hashtag kayak to work scheme is that uh is not not only for me commuting but also training for um for uh, another sort of kind of quite a large expedition on a kayak and the history to this expedition is that in the 17th century in north on the northwest coast of 
Scotland, there was an Inuit community that arrived there. Um, and no one really knew how they got there. No one really knew why they got, why they arrived or what their incentive was. Anyway, this summer, Ollie Hicks and myself uh, are setting out to prove that they could have come from Greenland to the continent, to north, to the northwest coast of Scotland by kayak. And so uh, we are kayaking from Greenland via Iceland, the Faroe Islands, to the northwest coast of Scotland on a sort of, I guess it's going to be a potentially a world first expedition. And, and uh, yeah, so that's our next trip. Jeez, that'd be good. This is very exciting. Yeah, that'd be, uh, that'd be, that'd be tough, but uh, geez, it'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, exactly it's, it'll be exactly that tough but but great I'm really really excited about that post potential um, just on success who's the first person that comes to mind when you hear the word successful and why successful in my industry in the industry that I'm in at the moment uh, oh, it doesn't have to be in that industry just in general in life or yeah or in your industry or, or just whatever is there someone that comes to mind when you hear the word successful uh, yeah, um, I sounds pretty, pretty, uh, it's, I, I, I'm proud, I'm proud to say that I think my parents are pretty successful. I think they've, they've, they've raised a super happy family and we're very lucky to have what we have, even though it's quite basic. Um, we work super hard, but, uh, but they, they kind of, they're pretty inspiring people. Um, but I think, I guess outside of them, um, uh, there are lots of inspiring people and lots of people who I think have succeeded, but you know, they might have earned a lot of money, but I guess the question is, is, is that success? Um, some people might argue, yes, it is. And some people might argue it's not because they might not be the happiest person, but I think sort of frontline frontline success is probably my parents. I've got just got a couple of questions on um, advice. Um, if you could make a phone call to the 20 year old George Bullard and give him a bit of advice, what would you tell him? <laughs> Uh, gosh, uh, mind you, I still feel 20. So uh, I think I'm just going to call him up and say, keep going. Uh, <laughs> don't stop doing what you love. Uh, so that's probably it. <laughs> and what about the best piece of advice you've ever received? Whether in, you know, in, um, in life or on for, uh, exploring. Uh, <laughs> um, I now have a bit of a bit of a philosophy that I, actually that's probably not the best bit of advice, but a fun bit of advice is that you know if anything starts going wrong, you should uh, stop and have a cup of tea and just <laughs> think about it. Think about it. But that's probably not, not the best bit of advice, but something that's just sprung to mind. The best bit of advice uh, that I've ever been given. Uh, I, I find it quite difficult to find my find my path in life. You know, I've been very lucky enough to do these adventures, but I've also sort of. Been, been trying to trying to make a career on the side of it in something different and i think as it probably came up and, and i just said it in fact you know people have been telling me to just to do what you enjoy and uh you know forget about the money because i think that'll come eventually or the, the life or the money that i need to survive will come eventually so i think i think probably that's probably the best bit of advice that i've ever been given um uh, and i think that's the light bit of life advice but when it comes to expeditions i suppose uh, you know, common sense and all those sorts of things and, you know, switching on, just basically being alert to, to all these amazing things around us uh, and look, looking for the simple things in life, I guess it's probably the, probably the most fun. So that's probably my, what I, what I, uh, what I would uh, say is my best bit of advice. Do you think you'll um, do any adventures uh, in a desert at all? Yeah, as in a, like a, a heat desert? Yeah, have you got any um, um, plans for that? Like um, eventually, you know, doing some sort of desert adventure? Absolutely. So uh, I, um, we just come back. I've just been on a little trip with my family actually to Oman into the empty quarter desert, which was very special. I wouldn't say it was an expedition, but it was definitely an adventure. Um, but I have, you know, I have a few plans. Um, there's a company called Hagen Hastings who are, uh, who basically make watches and they're based in Australia and uh, have a few plans to come out to Australia and do a, and do some stuff uh, do some stuff in your great country. So, you know, whether it be uh, Western Sahara, Australia, or, or maybe into the Sahara Desert, who knows, but we've got to watch this space and, uh, you know, there's, there's lots in the pipeline. And if you guys have got any ideas and any expeditions that you think are impossible, I'd love to come and give them a try. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, do you have a recommendation for any particular book? Do you have a favorite book at all that you could uh, recommend listeners? So I guess um, part of part of my background means that I'm a terrible reader. I mean, I just find sitting down reading, I don't know, at this time of my life, pretty tough. Or even audio book? Yeah, <laughs> there is there is, I guess, one book that I've uh, managed to struggle my way through and I guess have been, uh, I guess, inspired by it. And it's a book called The Worst Journey in the World by Apsley Cherry Garrard. And he he was on an expedition, the expedition with Scott. Uh, he wasn't on the polar tri- polar party. He went to the pole or the fatal polar party. He went to the pole. Uh, he was on a he was on the sort of science team and went off to go and study some some king penguins or some emperor penguins and um, bring an egg back and they and turned out to have I guess just an cr- incredible journey of um, not only just in its physical term but also in terms of human fortitude and human resilience. It was a pretty special book. Yep. So if you want to read a book, it'd be the long the worst journey in the world yeah, yeah, cool. by Ashley Cherry. And whereabouts can people find out more about you? Um online and where can they reach out to you and say hi and follow your your future adventures Uh, that's really kind matt thanks so much for mentioning that so i guess one of the things that now i'm a full-time adventurer explorer um these things weirdly become important and it's a i guess it's a bit of a shame for me that that social media has become so important but it has and i'm desperately trying to to unlock my social media potential but i guess i'm on facebook um just type in george below there's a page uh, I think it's uh, the, the URL is Bullard G, but George Bullard has a page. I'm on Instagram as George underscore Bullard underscore Explorer. I'm on Twitter but as George underscore Bullard. And uh, I guess my website, uh, georgebullard.co.uk. Um, you can find out lots about what I've been done personally. But then I guess I go adventures uh, is the I go adventures.com is the uh, is the website where you guys can get involved in life changing expeditions across the globe. Yep. Yeah, that's excellent. I'll put all the um, all the links in the show notes. Good luck with your future adventure coming up in June and no doubt you'll um, – I can't see you putting your feet up now and, you know, becoming an accountant. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope not. <laughs> so, yeah, keep in touch. Um, and, yeah, well, I'll definitely follow you online and, um, you know, just keep an eye out for your future adventures and – uh, make sure you post heaps of photos and stuff. I'll keep um, trying. And yeah, thanks. I'll keep going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess yeah. Please like, add, share, follow. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> yep, we'll do. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, well, thanks again for your time. No problem. My pleasure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, George. Bye now. You've just been listening to the Born to Kick Ass podcast at BornToKickAss dot com. If you liked what you heard and want more, please subscribe on iTunes. Give a five-star rating and a kick-ass review. This really helps to boost our presence and continues to allow us to introduce you to the most fascinating people on the planet. Welcome aboard and catch you next time.